All right, we're going to get started with the Ignite Talks. And uh, has anyone here never heard of an Ignite? Should I do a brief explanation? Well, guess what? I'm going to do it anyways. <clears throat> Each individual presenting has five minutes to talk. And they have no control over the slides. They auto advance. So they must be in somewhat sync with the slides that move. This presents a challenge. If you talk too fast, you sit there and look awkward and wait for your slide. Or if you talk too slow, the opposite happens, obviously. So our first Ignite speaker is Mr. Adam Goodman from Duo Security fame. So Adam, come on up. And we will put five minutes on the clock. And I'll do like a whole shotgun start thing here. So Adam Goodman, Duo Security, are you ready? So uh, back in September, we learned that a number of apps in the iOS App Store were uh, compromised with some malware that they called Xcode Ghost. It turns out this got there because a bunch of developers in China were looking for faster places to download Mac app development tools, and they ended up getting this evil version from an unauthorized mirror. This wasn't that big of a deal in practice because it wasn't that e evil. It was fairly easy to detect, but in general, this is the sort of thing that freaks me out. You, you think about like a compromised tool chain, this means that even if we do security perfectly for our own code, for our own deployments, we could still get owned by things entirely that seem entirely beyond our control. Now, uh, I might come off a bit paranoid in this talk. It's OK. It's kind of my job. I'm a security guy at a security company. It's up to you all to determine what risks actually apply to your organizations, what you should worry about. But I'm going to talk about a few of the things that keep me up at night. And kind of in the context of, I call it like the software supply chain, it's a little bit like you know, your development pipeline, except if you consider external dependencies and infrastructure a little bit more closely. So to start off, let's actually talk about external dependencies, because we, uh, we all have quite a lot of them. And even so, when I'm thinking about trying to, you know, adding a new tool or library to our project, I like to try to determine whether or not I think this thing is trustworthy at least a little basic determination. Now this guy, Ken Thompson, co-invented Unix and gave a super famous lecture a few decades ago in which the conclusion seemed to be that basically, no, you can actually never trust code that you didn't write. Sorry, game over. Uh, but actually, I think the message to take was that you need to trust people writing the code. And I usually trust that people are honest and well-intentioned. So when I talk about trust, what I'm actually looking for is, can I trust you to respond maturely to security incidents? Because we're all human. We all make mistakes. We're all probably going to be the cause of like a pretty severe bad security problem at some point in our lives. And so if you have a response process, that's good. If you have a bug bounty, that's fantastic. And if you've gone through this whole exercise before and actually responded to an incident, that's fantastic. Unless the way that you responded to an incident was you ignored the first two bug reports of a critical issue before finally getting around to acknowledging it's a problem. This is the sort of thing that gives me pause and makes me think maybe I shouldn't use your code. Uh, by the way, there are some systematic solutions that people are building for this. Uh, these tools basically scan your projects and try to figure out if you're using libraries with known security issues. They're cool. Check them out maybe, especially if you're doing mobile development. OK, so now we've decided, yeah, we're going to use this thing. When you actually go to import it into your project, please do everything you can to make sure you're getting the authentic product, not like the backdoored version. Check the checksums. Check the signatures if they're there. Download over HTTPS, you know, all those things. And I would say you should also download things from external sources as infrequently as possible. That reduces your, the attack surface against you, but it also means, it, for example, if NPM decides to change their SSL certificate, we don't want our ability to develop our apps to break. A good way to deal with that particular problem if you're using these sorts of package repositories is to host your own you, you, with just the dependencies that you care about. Most of them support this quite easily, and that way the infrastructure is under your control and you don't actually have to change your workflow very much. Finally, just as an aside, it, it bothers me that a bunch of these guys are way behind the like mainline Linux sisters and adding things like package signatures that would defend against crazier threats, but they're making progress, so I don't know, stay tuned. OK, so now we're actually writing our own code. Something that scares me is the day that someone hacks into one of our developer laptops and uses it to commit a backdoor to our system. With something like Git in particular, it can be kind of hard to figure out exactly who authored some line of code, because people necessarily have to be able to commit things written by other people. 
but Git supports GPG signatures for commits. So that's like kind of cool. I'd, I'd love to make use of those. I don't yet, honestly, but it seems like a very good idea. And finally, just real quick, if you have a build and deploy process and you're not using like a clean build environment to do this, you should really consider it. It would have neutralized Xcode Ghost, for example, if these guys had just had one clean build environment running the real Xcode. So quick review again. Be careful when you're selecting third-party libraries and tools. When you actually go to import them, make sure you're getting the real thing and try not to download it more often than you need to. Uh, make sure you can trust the source code in your own repository if you care about that sort of thing and use build servers and stay safe out there. The internet's a scary place. I think I'm gonna go wrap myself in aluminum foil now, so if you need me, send me an email. <laughs> okay, I guess this thing's a, uh, whoops. Yeah. Uh, you're good. That one wasn't live fire. The last one I was at, they just kept on rolling. Um, anyway, my name's David Shackelford. I'm on the product team at PagerDuty. And um, PagerDuty is operation software. And one of the things that we do is on-call scheduling and escalation. And so I want to share some of the stuff that I've learned from nerding out on schedules for a long time. Way too long in SQL, way too many customer visits. Um, I've been getting deep into this stuff. So uh, basically, on-call is this problem of how do you have some problem that needs to get to a human or a set of humans? And the basic way you do that is you have something that catches an exception, and it sends an email to a human, or maybe you have an email to SMS gateway. But we can do a little better than that, because once we have a bunch of people that need to respond, um, spamming them all is not so great for their quality of life. Um, so in optimizing this, we basically want to make sure that somebody's going to fix it. We want to keep switching costs and handoff costs relatively low. And then we want to be sustainable. We want to work to minimize burnout. So the first place people usually go is a rotation. You know, I'm on call this week. You're on call next week. Just a, a linear way of moving around people. And most of the schedules in our system are either weekly or biweekly rotations. So um, you're, you're rotating about every seven days, for some teams, every 14 days. And this actually works pretty well. It's a great place to start. When you start getting bigger teams, especially that biweekly rotation, if you have like 10 people on your team, might mean that it's a long time between on calls. So you have to have some process in place to keep track of context. Another variation we see if you have different operational needs on the weekends versus the weekdays, you might have a separate set of shifts on the weekends versus the weekdays. Some people really like to plan their lives. And here I've seen some customers go with a monthly schedule. So I'm on January, you're on February, somebody else is on March. It's really nice because I know outside that month, I'm not on call. But it means you really have to maintain good uh, knowledge transfer between shifts. Of course, at the other end of the frequency spectrum, you've got people going daily, where it means that everybody has a lot of context. Everyone's in the loop because you're changing so frequently. But it's a lot of switching costs. It's a lot to coordinate. And we have this, uh, this one crazy customer that actually has this concept of the ops hot seat, where everybody on the team spends one to two hours a day getting all of the alerts, and then one to two hours later, it switches. And I don't quite understand it, but they seem really happy with it. It, uh, it works for them. If you're, uh, if you're lucky enough to have a globally distributed team, and you don't necessarily need 24-hour coverage, but if you're lucky enough to have offices in different time zones, structuring on-call such that people respond to alerts during the time they're getting paid to be there is really, really nice for quality of life. And obviously, if you can get global coverage, that's great as well. But what I'm really excited about is more dynamic routing, not just static rotations. And I've seen some patterns with things p customers have done with our API. So the first is round robin. I get the first incident, you get the next, the next person gets the next. And that's cool because it really reduces the variation in page load per person. We all get about the same number of pages. On the other hand, it breaks flow a lot. Um, the number of people getting interrupted is a lot higher. Something better for flow is this idea of a race to the pager. So an incident drops into Slack unassigned. Whoever's got the bandwidth, whoever's ready to be interrupted grabs it. And then if it goes too long, then it falls through to a secondary escalation. My favorite is deploy driven. You deploy to production. And programmatically, you are put on call. Because that raises the likelihood that the person that broke the system is the person that's getting paged for that outage. It's, it's just my favorite. Um, so. You know, in addition to these patterns of uh, how you rotate, um, I just wanted to share some other best practices that have just come up in the feedback that people have given us when they're talking about sort of managing their 
their on-call scheduling work. So um, the first thing is to take on-call handoff really seriously. Um, write down significant stuff that happened. Midweek is often a better time than Mondays or Fridays just because people tend to be around. And it's often nice to put your secondaries in on the rotation before your primary so you see what's coming before you get there. The next piece that I think is incredibly important is empower your responders to fix the shit that pages them. If you get paged for something, even if it's not customer impacting, you should be able to take time when you're on call to go stop that thing from paging you and then the next person and the next person. I think that's super important. And then finally, you know, we're, we're always learning with this stuff. You can start wherever you start, but always be in the cycle of talking to your people, learning what works, changing it up, improving, just like doing the build, measure, learn stuff. Um, and uh, that's about it. Happy on calling. Hello. So uh, I have a confession to make. When I pitched this talk, the tool that it's about was not written. In fact, I pitched it mostly as a motivating tool to get me to write it. So my name is Rex. I work at Blue Newt Software. Um, we have a history of building um, graphic simulations, automotive and, and, uh, and military use. We also built this tool called Pinch to help profile those tools, but I'm not going to talk about either of those things. Um, a couple of years ago, we partnered with this company called Zebra. Zebra makes these little RFID tags. Um, <clears throat> uh, I don't think they work inside tinfoil. And the RFID tags track players, sports players, turns it into a stream of data, which our software interprets and ends up in a lot of places. Um, so <clears throat> that leaves me maintaining these servers across the country in stadiums. And um, unfortunately, those stadiums are not always up. Um, you might guess which league this is. So, um, yeah, we have, we have stadiums that uh, are outside the country. We have stadiums that um, their server room might not be able to support servers except for during game days. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, but there is a time we know they're up, and that is on a Thursday, a Sunday, or a Monday, because um, sports teams have specific days of the week where they play. And we know that during that specific week, that server is going to be up. So for a lot of reasons, we use Ansible for this. Um, Ansible's awesome. I probably don't have to tell you guys. Uh, if you can get SSH set up, you can configure your machines with Ansible. Um, <clears throat> now, I, I, after doing this for a couple weeks, I immediately realized I had this problem. You probably can't really read this, but I can't figure out where the N's and the T's are in Cincinnati. So I can't. <laughs> what I, I, I taught our uh, Slack bot all about um, the, the schedule, and then I would go to the Slack bot and I would ask him for the schedule for the upcoming week, copy and paste, and always have a nightmare. I realized right away that I was wasting my time with manual labor when I'd much rather be doing this, which is a joke, I mean, but in reality, it's what we should be doing, automating as much as we can, spending as much time as we can to be lazy. So <clears throat> this is what our Ansible repo looks like, basically. Um, there's three letters in the order there that you're not supposed to see. But um, I didn't want to change this too much. Uh, I wanted to solve this problem, but I didn't want to confuse my developers. So um, Ansible already has this great thing called a dynamic inventory, where any executable you can come up with that can output JSON can be your inventory for your Ansible. Um, <clears throat> so what I needed to do was uh, take our existing inventory, which is, this is an example of what part of it looks like. And it's in the standard Ansible inventory format, which I don't particularly love because um, <clears throat> it doesn't strictly bind to any real file format. It's kind of like config syntax. What I did is I rewrote the whole thing in YAML. Um, I also don't love it, but I do love the way that the relationships and the data make a lot more sense to me. Um, and there's like real data typing in there. Uh, it may not be my final form, but it works for now. Um, <clears throat> luckily, Ansible already had uh, YAML parsing for an inventory. Uh, they took it out in version 1.3, but I went back in the GitHub history and I pulled it out because uh, I'm not really a Python developer. I've been trying to uh, unhate Python after learning Perl for like 15 years. So here's some code that I, um, very advanced Python code, you can probably figure out that I wrote, that pulls down the schedule and uh, puts it in a object in Python. And then what I do is I 
compute uh, the upcoming Monday, Thursday, and Sunday, um, and then link the site ID in our inventory with the site ID that I'm being told is the upcoming schedule. Um, it's really simple. I mean, I copied and pasted most of this from Stack Overflow, but I think that makes me a real developer. So um, <laughs> one of the important pieces here is the, uh, the meta host virus thing at the top. So this is my JSON output. Now, what you need to do is you need to, if you write one of these, um, what's also really awesome about dynamic inventories is if you're hosted on Amazon um, and or Rackspace or DigitalOcean and you want to uh, query them. Um, but you can see here, if you don't use that meta host virus thing, uh, my code went from under a second to over 20 seconds, which um, it's because it's running that thing for every single host in your inventory. Uh, <clears throat> and even if you're not doing very much, it takes a long time. You can see here there's uh, some output that actually works. Um, so this tool works, and I can actually use it now. Um, yeah, so that's all. If you're interested, I threw up this GitHub repo of mine. Nice. <laughs> cool. Just up. All right, here we go. So here is the story. Uh, I'm a developer. I have an app, um, and I run this app on Amazon Web Services. I have a neat diagram that shows how everything works. The labels and everything are not important. It's just stuff I pay for by the hour. Um, now, of course, I'm a responsible developer, so I test things before I deliver them to my customers. So I want to have really, I want to have test and production environments. Um, so I need to build another one of these. And I can point and click through Amazon in the browser, um, probably with the best of them, right? But, um, so I can probably do this in an hour, maybe less, but, uh, but really, um, I'm thinking that's error prone, that's something I probably don't want to do um, more than once. So in the age of robotic surgery and 3D printing, there must be a way I can tell a computer how to produce one of these. Uh, so one way is Ansible. Um, I like Ansible. It is quite good at the configuration management problem. If I want to put packages and configuration files on a server, I give a list of tasks. Ansible walks through the tasks. It applies changes, changes state as necessary. There's pager duty. Um, okay, thanks. Now, Ansible wants to be more than a configuration management system. It's trying to be sort of more ambitious, doing something they call multi-tier orchestration. So I can use built-in Ansible modules to do things like create a security group for my load balancers, create an app group, and have one sort of reference the other and start to build up that whole, um, that whole thing that we operate. And so that works pretty nicely. Um, it, if I you know, delete one of these resources, rerunning the playbook will recreate that resource. Um, if it's already there, then Ansible moves along without touching anything. So that's, that's pretty neat. Um, and that's worked quite well for our team in migrating from a place of zero automation um, up to this, what you call multi-tier orchestration, which was crucial for migrating our uh, sort of flagship monolithic application uh, from co-located hosting to Amazon Web Services, which is nice for us. It's not moving. So I'd like to look at more nice things. This is, uh, this is how I describe my uh, soup, I guess, to Terraform. So Terraform has kind of a graph-based or model-based a representation of my system. It understands what components uh, depend on other components. So it's more of a declarative thing. I'm declaring relationships, and instead of writing tasks, uh, Terraform is able to, at runtime, based on the model that I've described, it will produce the list of tasks. It will compare that against the current state of the system, and it will give me the option to review that plan. I can either accept the plan and move forward, apply it, or I can reject that. I can use that to destroy the whole system. Um, if I care to safely because it's tracking the state of everything. Uh, they also have very nice coverage of Amazon services, pretty much anything that I care to use. Um, and so moving on. Uh, so really, I kind of have, I've deployed my app to, to Amazon Web Services, but I really have kind of a different goal in the back of my mind. Um, what I'm really trying to do is not to have sort of a custom playbook, custom Terraform configuration for every application that we ship. Really, I want to enable my developer friends uh, to be able to, as they're developing new applications and services, to put them in a production environment basically on day one uh, without having to clone things, without having to fork playbooks and things like that. So ultimately, uh, the community is right. Basically, I'm trying to build a platform. Okay. Um, so in this case, um, this brings us to a nice uh, tool that just appeared this year, um, come up in a bit, called Convox. 
Uh, Convox is a startup um, uh, started by Heroku alumni, and basically it um, installs itself into my Amazon account. Uh, it creates a bunch of resources, uh, creates what it calls a rack, and the rack is the basis for then installing and deploying my applications. Um, so it handles all of this, and my applications live in one of these boxes. I get a nice uh, command line interface to that where I uh, can create an application, I can scale my application, I can set environment variables, um, I can do all sorts of things, put an SSL certificate on my application, things like that, stream logs. Uh, so at this point, this probably sounds a lot like Heroku, and I mentioned the Heroku alumni, so that's probably pretty accurate um, of an assumption. So I think this is a nice fit um, for things that sort of more well-behaved, more kind of smaller apps when we talk about microservices or things like that. Um, for our uses, we're looking to kind of uh, supplement our monolithic application with an ecosystem of smaller apps and services. Um, this could be a nice way to accelerate uh, and help people get there. So uh, with that, let's see. So yeah, so I, th so I think um, in a lot of cases, I actually care what I'm running on, in which case I probably uh, might be using Ansible or Terraform. Um, for a lot of other deployment use cases, I may be using those as building blocks um, to, to build a platform as a service or use an open source offering like Convox, like um, uh, Cloud Foundry, of course, and uh, Yelp apparently released something called Pasta as well. So uh, with that, um, we conclude. Thank you. Have you Dev DevOps days?